Hello, everyone, and welcome to AIM High, the live, interactive, free online school. This online school is built to welcome the likes of our next guest, whose entire life has been in pursuit of creating a better planet. He's nearly died multiple times working to uncover stories to protect people and nature. He's written countless astute and accessible books on subjects from globalization to climate. He's founded or co-founded numerous organizations for positive change, including the brilliant Rewilding Britain, Natural Climate Solutions, and many others. His short films have been watched many millions of times, including two must-watch pieces, including Nature Now with Greta Thunberg and Tom Mustill, and How Wolves Change Rivers, which is amazing. Uh, he's even a musician with an album out a few years ago, and he continues to write some of the most inspiring columns and articles available to read. I am really excited to welcome George Mombio for everyone to me. I'm Matthew. Hello, everyone. We're going to be, be talking about a variety of things, including um, COVID-19, climate, um, nature as, as being central to, to education. My first question to you is, um, you had a near-death experience in the jungles of Papua. Yes, yes. Okay, right. I was thinking of uh, the time that you got lost in the jungle. So the only um, way of getting to the place we were trying to investigate down in the um, south of West Papua without getting caught by the soldiers and the police under this heartened dictatorship. The only way we could get there was to walk. To walk from the central highlands down to the swamps in the south. And to begin with, that it was physically difficult and very remote, scarcely habited mountains. But then down the other side, going south, the trails very quickly disappeared. And we found ourselves in an area which hadn't been inhabited for about 50 years. But there were no paths, no trails, nothing. There were sheer cliff faces um, that we had to find our way up and find our way down. And before long, we got completely lost. We ended up um, eating rats, snakes, stick insects. I lost a couple of stone. I didn't have a lot of weight to lose at that time. But um, we came out I mean, really properly famished when eventually we got out. Um, we were constantly uh, aware that we could get caught at any of the pinch points if we came down the rivers, we were caught by military checkpoints, and then we'd probably get killed. But eventually we got out, and we came down into the swamps. We managed to um, rent a dugout canoe and then paddled for a few days until we got to a mission station, and then we were able to um, go overland till we got to this horrendous transmigration site where huge numbers of people were being burnt out of their homes and murdered if they resisted and their land was being grabbed by big businesses by big ranchers and I had heard that there was stuff kicking off I went straight there was really thrust right into the heart of a massive attempt by local people to resist the land grabbing and before very long, I was completely immersed in the dispute myself, having fallen foul of the rancher and then of the military police. And it eventually ended up with me having to run for my life and um, got back to, to um, Manaus, where I was living in, in the center of the Amazon. And it had a rather interesting and bizarre coda. I went back to the human rights organization in Manaus who put me onto this story and told me this is where I need to be. I went back to the brief. And as I walked into my friend's office there, he was on the phone. And it turned out that on the phone was um, Jan Rosha from The Guardian, who was a correspondent there. This was years before I had anything to do with The Guardian. And she said, oh, well, I hear you've just come back, you just come back from Marignan. I said, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it was all pretty hairy out there. Um, but yeah, I've just come back from a land dispute. Oh, well, you're just a person because I'm investigating the story of this journalist who's been killed out there. I said, oh, man, that sounds terrible. What was happening? She said, well, there was this British journalist working around Bacabal. I said, that's amazing. That's just where I would work. And I said, I'm amazed I didn't come, uh, come across this person. Um, yeah, he was found garroted behind the police station. Um, the police murdered him. I said, God, that's terrible. I said, so, so who, who was this person? Who was he working for? Um, I've got the name here. It's George Mon Monbio, Monbiot something. Not quite sure. I said, mm. I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm afraid your story might not stand up. <laughs> and it turned out that my death, unbeknown to me, had already been reported in several Brazilian newspapers. 
I was just thinking about how um, your trip back to the Amazon became part of a BBC training, safety training video on how not to do journalism, right? BBC had this uh, radio series called Going Back to Places of Considerable Significance to Them in the Past. And they asked me, would I like to do one? And this was seven years after a particular um, set of experiences. And I said, yeah, I'd like to go back to um, the state of Marignan and see what's happened to the local people there and to the police who were responsible, who were basically the enforcers for the ranchers and had killed so many of them. So the first thing I did with the um, uh, BBC producer I was with was to go to this man, this torturer and murderer at work, the sergeant at the police station, who was you know, the, the man most responsible for, for the killings, and turned up outside his house. And I knocked on the door, there was no reply. And after a while, I saw this huge bulky figure, it was an enormous big bloke, I saw this, his, his silhouette behind the blind, just opening the blind and looking out. And so I went across the road and said, Vito de Costa, I know you're in there. Come on out and talk to me about, and I and started naming all the people he'd murdered and all the people he'd tortured. Because I thought, you know, he can't not come out if I'm there in the street shouting out about his crimes. And eventually the door flies open and he pulls out this revolver and he's you've got one second to get out and we just leg it round the corner. So uh, anyway, this whole thing goes out on, on the radio and for the next 10 years, the BBC used it in their health and, self, health and safety training course as to what not to do when making a programme. They never asked me to make another one after that. I don't think why. Amazing. I want to talk a little bit about COVID, but I also want to talk about your, your views on the, on the NHS. The NHS, for those watching internationally, that's the National Health Service of, of the UK. What holds it together? And do you think that the NHS is as it should be? Well, and the NHS is basically held together by goodwill. I mean, it, it's basically a community. And, and people go uh, way beyond their contracts in working for it. Um, spending far more time, putting far more effort into their jobs and their contracts demand, because if you um, if you don't, you're letting down your colleagues and you're letting down the patients, and it's it's very much seen by people working there as a collective effort. But what successive governments have been trying to do have been to balkanize it, to split it up, um, to subject it to competition. Uh, to outsource as much as they can. And as a result, the community has started to fall apart. This is what happens when the self-hating state wages war on its own institutions. And you've got a, a system of thought, which we call neoliberalism, which says that the private sector is always more efficient, is always more efficient to outsource, um, to offshore, to privatize, to marketize, than to allow a government institution to stand and be um, um, self-organized. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit about how uh, the current situation with, with COVID relates to the current state of nature. And also looking at COVID itself, some say uh, that we could come out of this worse, some say we could come out of this better. Um, and what do you think, George? The pandemic and the environmental crisis do overlap. I mean, for a start, it looks as if um, COVID-19 came from the um, international wildlife trade, which has been a total catastrophe for wild species, for their abundance and diversity. But of course, we see livestock farms also being a breeding ground for zoonotic diseases, reducing the effectiveness of antibiotics. So there's a whole series of interactions between Systems which are catastrophic for nature, which turn out to be catastrophic for, for human health as well. Now, in terms of how we might come out of it, there is a great opportunity for a great reset, switching um, the whole basis of the economy towards a regenerative circular economy as opposed to one which just has to keep growing and growing while using ever more resources and producing ever more pollution. But unfortunately, it looks as if governments are determined not to take it. They just seem to want to get the old, dirty economy back on the road. We, we could turn the whole economy round if we chose to. And the only thing missing 
is political will. Uh, Ella has asked a question, which is, do you think that the positive environmental outcome of the pandemic is um, more selective broadcasting? <sighs> Broadcasters and media in general. Look, I mean, the, the, the model is fundamentally cropped. The great majority of the media is owned by billionaires. They are our enemies. And yet they um, use their media empires to pretend to be our friends. And then you've got public sector broadcasters like the BBC, which were once, a long time ago, quite brave organisations which did a lot of investigative journalism, but are now being completely disciplined and tamed. Um, they're, they're not hearing the voices of the people who are at the wrong end of the boot. Um, what they constantly hear uh, are the voices of the people who have power. George and I met at the climate protests uh, quite recently. We were walking past these beautiful Dalmatian pelicans. And I'm, I'm going to ask George to tell me the story that he, that he told me as we were walking past them. This was a native bird for the UK. We used to live right across Europe and their bones in the fossil record coming up into the Middle Ages. And the only reason they don't live here today is human persecution. They were eaten, uh, the marshes where they lived were drained, they were persecuted by various means um, until they became extinct here. They're quite prone to that because they're um, towards the top of the food chain and animals towards the top of the food chain are far more ecologically vulnerable on the whole than those towards the bottom. Um, and one of my ambitions is to bring them back. One, because they are magnificent, fantastic, amazing birds with a 10-foot wingspan, one of the heaviest flying birds on Earth. But also because if we had them living here again, it would show once more that we had healthy and thriving ecosystems. I'm from a farming family, and I kind of believe that we have to bring farmers along with us. What, what should we say to farmers, and how do we bring them along with us? The truth is we're not going to bring all farmers with us. There are going to be very few livestock farmers who are going to say, yeah, I'll subscribe to that. You know, that's not going to happen. And so what we need to be looking for is governments to repurpose subsidies to help people get out of those industries and, and to get other forms of employment or put their land to different uses. And you know, what I would love to see is that land being used for rewilding, for instance, and for nature-based economy. It's the same with any other industry. You need structural change. We are constantly taught by our culture that, that to win is to dominate. And we look at nature and that's just simply not true. It's, you know, if, if any one species dominates, then it's at the cost of all of them. And also we understand extremely well that a monoculture field of corn is, is destroying the soil. And, and that actually we need, we need diversity for, for things to flourish. Um, I know that you've uh, started teaching your daughter, Koji, and I, I've, got a, I've got a picture here, which I'm going to show to everyone now, um, of her with, with the painting that you guys have done, why you've taken, it, taken this into your own hands. I've been trying to um, put ecology at the centre of learning, and I actually think that ecology leads this into so many other subjects. It's a way to get into maths. It's a way to get into wider biology, chemistry physics uh, is a way to get into literacy it's a way to get into painting um, and and because ecology is literally it's at the center of our lives it's at the center of our very existence you can work outwards from it into almost anywhere and so what we did in this particular case was i got my daughter and her best friend to um, paint 15 separate panels showing ecosystems all the way from the mountain tops to the bottom of the deepest sea and, and we could talk about everything from trophic cascades to sedimentation to the water cycle to the carbon cycle to decomposition, erosion. I hope that all of our students will be hoping to get into careers where they can make a positive difference. If you, if you want to get into a role where you want to change things for the better, then, then you have to be quite imaginative nowadays. Uh, and I think, I think it's really important for us to be imaginative if, if we're going to change things for the better. I mean... Um, no positive change ever happened in the world by doing things the way that they've always been done. And it takes creativity to invent, courage to stand by what's right, and perseverance to bring about progress. Yeah, well, perseverance is the most important bit. You've just got to stick at it. And you'll be rebuffed a hundred times before you get the break. You've just got to keep sticking in there. It's resilient, it's 
is perseverance. Those are the two things that will get you through more than anything else, more than skill, more than talent, more than experience. Resilience, perseverance, just stick with it. And eventually you'll find a way through. Do not give up. Thank you so much, George. So I, I just want to start to to wrap up and say um, to everyone, yeah, if you're, if you're not trying to change the world for the better, then you're, then you're living in the wrong time. Um, and if you if you haven't already, do please follow our socials, which you can see over here. They're all at Aim High Live and spread the word about what we are trying to do here. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, uh, George, for for taking the time for us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Lovely to talk to you all. Thanks. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you all. We will be back next week. Farewell.